Well, today, uh, as uh, Greg Weber Elder said a moment ago, uh, we continue our series called Summer Soundtrack. We've got a copy of the scriptures with you. Throw with me to soundtrack number 37. Uh, 37. I don't know if that's the B side or, you know, but we're there towards kind of, uh, not towards the middle, all, all, all the way, the halfway to the middle. So Psalm 37 is where we're going to be. Now we're starting verse 4 in a moment. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to be on the screen, in the room, and online. We are uh, going to put this on demand on YouTube, even though we're not live right now. But Psalm 37, verse 4. Uh, you're kind of keeping track with me. This is another Psalm of David. For those that are brand new to the Bible, brand new to church, welcome. You are so welcome. We're glad that you're here. You belong here. I want to catch you up who David is. David was a shepherd boy that felt like he was forgotten. But he was not, he's forgotten by man, but he was not forgotten by God. Aren't you glad? Yeah, in our lives too. And so he's a shepherd boy who uh, took down a giant named Goliath. You probably heard that story, David and Goliath. He took him down with a slingshot. Pretty impressive how God used him in that way. He eventually became a mighty king. We see him show up all throughout the Old Testament. And this is one of the Psalms that he wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He didn't write all of them, but he wrote most of them. So Psalm 37, one of the greatest hits, starting in verse 4. I'm going to read out the NIV. Here's what it says. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous rewards shine like the dawn. Your vindication like the noonday, uh, noonday sun. Be still. It's the verse that we know is the bar right here. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. We love that verse. Maybe your grandma crocheted that somewhere. It was up on her wall. Maybe you got it on a coffee mug somewhere. We love that verse. We know that verse. We quote that verse. But how y'all know we also secretly hate that verse? Right? Like, like we hate the wait. It is not easy to wait. So here's the question we're asking that for for a moment. But here's the question we're asking that I hope that we'll answer up and we will. But here's the question. Why does God make me wait? You probably had that question before. Maybe you're in the middle of that question now. Why does God have me waiting? We're going to try to answer that. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways. When they carry out their wicked schemes, refrain from anger, turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. Same chapter, move down to verse 23 with me now. 37 still, and now verse 23 of chapter says this, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. I love this next part. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. Does that not preach right there, church? Right. Like you're going to stumble, you're going to stub your toe. If I've done that in the building tonight, you know your bed post that we're in, right? You just know. you got to turn the light on and it'd be hard to fall back and think of what happened when you stub that toe. Like you're you're going to stumble, but you're not going to Fall. I've got to preach on this just for a second. What David is saying here, being led by the Holy Spirit, is that when you delight in the Lord, what does that mean, Pastor? Here's what it means. When you enjoy being in God's presence, when you enjoy worshiping God, when you, when you, when you have delight in I'm serving God, I'm ministering to God's people, it is a joy to open up a word. It's, it's a joy to be in God's house on a Sunday morning instead of sleeping in. When you delight in the Lord, then you may stumble, but you won't fall. Meaning that you will go through fire, but you won't get burned. Meaning that sometimes you'll be stuck in the eye of the hurricane, but you will not drown. Meaning that you're going to go through some stuff on this side of eternity, but the devil cannot knock you out. Come on, somebody in the audience. You are not promised greatness when it comes to everything perfect in life on this side of eternity. But even when it's hell on earth, God is with you when you're delighted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord upholds him with his hand. I love that too. I was young and now I am old. You don't have to say amen to that, right? <laughs> Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the children begging bread. They are always generous and live freely. Their children will be a blessing. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Aren't you thankful for God's word? 
Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much. So grateful for your word. So many incredible lines and bars throughout the Psalms, God. Out of 150 chapters, there's so much gold for us to unearth, to unpack together. And so I pray, God, today that you speak to me and through me, through your people. The Holy Spirit, you would have your way. You know, my notes and my prep and my, my praying and planning and even fasting this morning for this moment. But God, you always have veto rights to speak exactly what you want to speak uh, to me and through me for your people. And I pray for at least one word from the first time guest all the way to the seasoned saints. Lord, for those that are not yet walking with you, and I believe it's going to change at the end of service to those that have been walking with you for decades. I pray for all of us, Lord, that you give us one word. Because we know one word from you changes everything. One word from you can bring breakthrough that there wasn't breakthrough before. So God, thank you in advance with expectation for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And again, the church said? Amen. Amen. The church said? Amen. Uh, every summer in our house, uh, we put together what we call a summer bucket list. Uh, my wife and I, we've got three young kids, and we have them play a part in this. And, and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a list of goals, of things that we want to do as a family, memories that we want to forge together before we send them back to school in God's name. Um, and so, so we put together this list, and it's a lot of fun. And I don't just think, oh, big time when I'm a pastor, all these big things. It's little things too. Uh, here's an example, I don't prejudge me too much. It's like going to our neighborhood pool. That's one of them, right? So there are some big things on there, no problem. Uh, but they're all uh, super huge things. So, for example, another example, uh, one of them we did recently that I was super proud of, pumped about, is we had decided as a family, we just checked this off our list. That we were going to have a good old-fashioned water balloon fight. Come on, somebody. Yeah. And, 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 and then that took me back to, to my childhood. And, and I've got some core memories involved with water balloon fights. Anybody with me, right? Like, like, and, and I can remember the good old days when you were a child. And let's just reminisce for a moment. I know, had, I know not everybody had an incredible childhood, but still there was some good moments there. And here's what's great about summer as a child. Uh, there's no responsibility. There's no details. Bless God. Like there's no stress in the relationships. Here is your sole focus as a child in the summer. Is who can I hit in the chest with the water balloon as hard as I can to the glory of God. That's my goal. That's my focus. And I remember those days of incredible moments. And my kids, uh, they don't know. But back in my day, Pastor too young to talk that. Back in my day, uh, there was a process to having a water balloon fight. You might know what I'm talking about. There was a process to it. There was serious prep work for the Lord. First of all, you had to convince your mom or whoever in the grocery store uh, shopping in your family. You had to convince your mom to pick up some artillery from the grocery store. Back in the day, we used cash and change. I'm talking quarters, nickels, dimes, even pennies. You might remember change. I don't know if you remember change. And what would happen is people would come over and they would sit on your couch. And to the glory of God as well, so they spill out of their pockets. As a child, you knew what purposes to search into. Come on, am I talking to anybody today? And you get as much shake as you could to try to tell them mom, you know, mom, I don't pay for everything. But when you hook me up, you know, and on some days, your mom would get you some artillery from the store. But it's in there. But here's what she'd pick you up. In fact, I never knew what this little pocket did before, but now I know. It's this little tiny water bottle. That's what this pocket's for, if you didn't know. I and literally, I mean, you can't see it in the background all the time. Literally, that's how small they were. This is what it looked like. And so you've got your ammo. And then what did you have to do next? Again, this is childhood for, for many of us. We had these next is you had to get the neighborhood kids involved. And this was back in the day. I know it's going to sound shocking. It's going to sound like it's sci-fi crazy. But back in the day, we actually used to go door to door to talk face to face. <laughs> I know it seems crazy, like, oh my goodness, how would we ever do that? We didn't talk on Xbox, we didn't talk on PS, but like, it, it wasn't through cell phone, we didn't have cell phones back then, you know, so like, it was none of that. You actually went to the house. You asked for the child, right, from mom and dad. And he said, hey, my mama got me some ammo. I got my ammo, you better get you some ammo. And what did you do? You picked sides and you scheduled the battle. We said it's going to be on at this time before the light poles come on in my neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's going to happen there. And then the day comes. And what did you have to do? You had to take the 
this little lip and blow into it. Yeah, stretch it out. You might know what I'm talking about. You got to fit it around the mouth of the faucet. Hello, was, was anybody else like me? I think I lost about 30% of my ammo ripping it in the sink. It's like casualty of war, you know? It's just friendly fire. I mean, I literally, as a little child, remember this. You had to have the dexterity of a brain surgeon just to be able to fit it all on there. And then once you got it off, you couldn't drop it, and you had to use your the tiny little hands, right? Your tiny little hands to take it and twist it around. Or at least one finger or two finger, everybody had their strategy, you know? And the whole goal was to tie it off at the end and not cut off the circulation of one of your fingers. Right? And if you got your ammo, and if you were lucky, you had about 20, 25 that survived. And then you went out there and you went into battle. And that was incredible memories and so, so much fun. But whenever we did this as a family, I've got to tell you, my kids know nothing about this as though we don't get out here. Here's what our kids know about. <laughs> Some of you don't know what this is. This is called Bunch of Balloons. It's an act of Satan. It's undog. So here's what this is, for those that don't know. Literally, you connect this end to a hose, and within seconds, you've got 50 balloons. This is crazy. It's not only do they all fill up instantly, but they plop off perfectly, and they time them. Our kids don't know about waiting. It's instant gratification. How many of y'all know when we had that water balloon fight, you can milk it as much as you want. You are done in seconds. In seconds to fill them up, in seconds to get rid of them. When you got only 20 to 25, you were saving that ammo. Right? I feel like our kids drop most of them just trying to get them out of the thing, you know? <laughs> but when you got 20 to 25, oh, I got to make sure I got, I got the laser focus. I got to make sure that I want to get this. Oh, I got to, oh, they told bad about me last week. I got to make sure, you know? <laughs> but when it's instant like that, there's no more value to it. Sure. And what's happening with really our kids' generation is that we are raising up a whole generation that does not know how to wait. It's instant, right now, on demand, got to have it in this moment. And if I don't have it now, I don't want it later. If I can have it now, we'll move on to something else that I can have right now. We hate the wait. We hate the wait. That verse is great. Be still. We don't like being still. And that wait patiently part, we just get that out of the door. We don't like that part. We hate the wait. This whole generation is people raised up this idea that if I don't have it now, then it's not worth it. So I think it's so interesting. And by the way, the Bible is never outdated. Uh, the Bible never uh, loses relevancy. Uh, it's not going to be 20, 50 one day if the Lord should tarry and Jesus not come back a second time just yet. Um, it's not going to be 20, 50 that we realize that you know God actually missed, messed up a couple of things. Like it will never, uh, never need to be updated. It will never be outdated. Somebody give God. And so, so I just love this, that David, before we were all born, being led by the Holy Spirit, he understood that waiting was not only a problem then, it's definitely going to be a problem one day in 2024. So you're taking us to church, write this down. But here's the first point, the first thing that David points out in Psalm 37, number one is this. Waiting is worth it. And I know it's hard to say amen to. I hate to wait as well. But waiting is worth it. David says again, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And we got to understand what the Holy Spirit is trying to get across to us, that life is a process. It's a process. It's a journey, not a destination. It takes time. Now, the context in this psalm is David is encouraging us to wait on the Lord, even when it feels like evil people are prospering and we're not. And man, that's relatable. This day and age. You see somebody else that stands for so many things that are ungodly and they are vocal. They're not ashamed about it at all. By the way, you should not be ashamed of the good news of the gospel. Right, right. We're all one of the kids plus people are not ashamed of evil. So let's not be ashamed of the good. We got the best news on the planet. We 
There's a burden there. There's a weight. There's a responsibility there. You tried to with me, church. And so God did for you the very thing that He wants to do. And you want Him to do. But if He did it right now, some of you would crush you because you're not yet prepared to shoulder the load. So here's the better question. Not God, why are you making me wait? God, what do you want me to learn in the waiting? Yeah, that's good. God, what can I learn now to expedite the waiting so that I can get the blessing that I believe you want for my life? That's the better question. God, what can I learn and how can I grow now to better understand, to hold on to, to support the weight of that blessing on my life? I know we hate the wait, but the waiting is worth it, so make it personal. Make it personal. I don't know what you're waiting on today, but odds are you're waiting on something or someone. Odds are all of us are waiting on something or, or someone. Maybe it's to get pregnant. Uh, maybe it's a job or a promotion that you're waiting on. Maybe it's a relationship to turn around. Maybe it's health or healing. Maybe it's breakthrough. And if you're waiting on something, let's be honest, it is difficult. It's not easy. Especially looking back at the context of Psalm 37. When you're waiting on God to do this one thing, and it seems like He's doing it for everybody else, that's hard. Yeah. Like, like social media has been this really challenging. It's like, say for example, um, you want want to get pregnant, and, and uh, for whatever reason, God is sovereignty, like it hasn't happened yet. And so there's a struggle, and you do all the stuff in the natural, and it just doesn't seem like God uh, is coming through in that way. And it's difficult because what happens? Uh, your best friend posts on social media that they just got pregnant. And what do you do? You, you comment and you say the right thing. So happy for you. You know? But, but, it, but if they can hear your tone, thank God they can't, right? Like, can we just be real and honest about this? Like, we feel this, this attention. Right. Like, oh, so happy for you. Yay, God, that's awesome. And then there you are. This, this negative test, after negative test, after negative test. Yeah. Or just in, in your job, you, you got a friend, you're in the same apartment. There's an opening above you both, and you're both going for promotion. And you're like, hey, I, uh, you would say this to them. You're like, I'm, I'm more qualified. I've been at this company longer. And so you're like, good luck. I hope you get it. I hope you get it. I hope you're both lying. You know, you're like, <laughs> right? We do this. Can we just be honest about that? We do this. And what happens? They get it. And they invite you to the party to celebrate. That, that, that we feel is really, really, really difficult, and we all feel this when we get this in the context of Psalm 37. You're believing for God, you need promotion, increase, whatever it is, a house, you've been an apartment for all your life, whatever it is, the thing, you fill in the blank. And you see an evil person get that. Somebody who does not serve God, somebody who cares less about God's house, somebody who's not tithing like you're tithing, not generous to the vision campaign like you are. Like, am I talking to anybody today? And you see an evil person excel, and you see an evil person prosper, and then again, you're like, God, have you forgotten me? Like, God, what's, what's going on? Is it even worse the way so you maybe ask? Maybe you could even say it out loud and you felt guilty about it. That was a question you had in your heart. Is it even worth it? Oh, I'll make it personal for Frisbo and my wife. Uh, we've waited for things for so long. Uh, I remember we got, we got three kids, and our oldest, I mean, a month and a half after we got married, we got pregnant with Luke. I love we didn't take we didn't take our time, right? Like, right. <laughs> yeah. But I remember, I remember as well, of course you'll remember this too, but even though know, this is all, uh, she got pregnant right away with Luke, we had a long, there's a reason why there's a big gap between Luke and our next child. It was, there was a long period of negative test results, a devastating miscarriage, and stats tell us that a lot of us in this room have gone through that, and it was just devastating, it was heartbreaking. And, and it was hard to wait. So you have friends that are having children, and you're trying to be happy for them, but the waiting is difficult. And you ask that question, how have you forgotten us? You know, we're serving the church, we're pastor, we're doing all the right things. It feels like waiting is difficult. Um, I remember even just personally, just with, with my career, my, my calling as a pastor, um, it was probably about a year that I was looking for a place to be a senior pastor. I'm from Dallas, most of you know that. Just give me your grace, Jesus, man. Uh, probably made it to the whole thing. Uh, we call this home now, but like 
But I, I remember, and I had gotten the approval from, from my senior pastor in Dallas. A lot of you have heard him speak. He spoke at our vision bank, but I got the approval from him to, to look out. He had earned that calling to be a senior pastor of the church of Alization. So in about a year, not a little bit more, and I'm putting out feelers, and I'm, I'm doing interviews and all that, and nobody wants you, and people won't even call you back. And, and even those that do, they eventually move on to somebody else. I remember for a long time, couldn't even find a place to apply to. And, and I know years is a long period of time in the grand scheme of things, but how many all know when you feel like you've got a calling from God, when yeah. your spiritual authority is affirming and giving permission to, to put feelers out there, and a year goes by, it's not much, it's crickets, that's hard. I think about this church, and I've shared the story off the record, but it was off the record, and it's not online. But basically what I talked about, it took us several years of traction. And it was during that time, I'm like, God, like, we're doing the right things. We're getting healthier in all these ways. We're trying to be faithful. We're doing all this, but it seems like it's not two steps forward. Like, I'll take two steps forward and one step back. I'll take it. But it's like ten steps back. Like, God, if you bring me here to shut down the church, kind of thing, where I was at. And, and it was a way the way it's difficult in the way. So I get it, you get it, but what do we do? Here's the second and last point from Psalm 37 quickly. You need to be encouraged by this today. Just encourage my heart. Number two, faithfulness is never forsaken. Amen. It is never forsaken. Everybody look at your pastor right now. When you are faithful, God is faithful. Yeah. God is faithful to the faithful. When you are full of faith, good times, bad times, God is faithful to you. When you faithfully live for God, when you faithfully serve God with your talents, when you faithfully are generous with our money, there you go, so about money again. That's what Psalm 37 talked about. When you're faithful with your money, when you're faithful, when you minister to hurting people, God will not forget you. He won't. He is a good father, and he rewards his kids. Once you look back at Psalm 37, this is that last part we read together. I want to highlight five things quickly, and then we're going to pray. Words will be on the screen. But I want you to see the principles here of what God says, promises, of when you're faithful, what He'll do. Okay? Because so many of you are faithful. And you're in that way, and the image of you, there's a gap in there. So I encourage you what God promises to you. By the way, God's promises are yes and amen. Here's what David says, people have other ones. When you're faithful, your family receives provision. What a promise. That your family will be provided for. Now sometimes we think we need something that God's like, we don't need that. But what you need, according to God, which is what you need, you will have. That's a promise that increases clear when you are faithful. When you're faithful, oh, I love this one as a dad, as a preacher, some parents and grandparents in the room. When you are faithful, you get a legacy. Yeah. That's what it says here. It's not why it's me. Your children will be blessed. Come on, parents. Is this not what you want most for your children? Right. That they have more than you have. Yeah. That God will move in their life more than He's moved in your life. Right. That yeah. can hurt. And you'll have it when you're faithful. When you're faithful, I love this one too, you will make an impact in a lot of people's lives. So it's not just legacy in your family, like blood family. It's legacy in God's family. Right. It's legacy in the people around you, your neighbors, your co-workers, your classmates. And you won't make a difference. Why? Because faithful people stand out from the faithless crowd. We all know stories of pastors that are not faithful. We all know stories of people that profess Christianity, but they care less about God in their real life. We all know those headlines. But when you are faithful, Christ come to church and you are faithful. When you are faithful, God sees you and God will cause you to shine. And you will impact people's life. about what I had to say if I was unfaithful. Correct? That's right. But when you're faithful, when you serve God, when you love God's so people, not perfect, but faithful, right. then you have a voice. And people will want to follow you. When you're faithful, I love this one. God gives you territory. It says it there. New territory, new opportunity, new land. I want some of that. I think we got some of that right now. What God's doing. The last thing before I pray, when you're faithful, God will give you the strength to never be not out. Yeah. You may be down, but you're not out. Right. You may be stumbling, but you will not fall. Yeah. 
a promise from God for you. You will go through fire without being burned. You will be caught in the eye of the hurricane, not drowned. The devil will target you, absolutely. But he will not take you out. Close your eyes, brother. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what he spoke today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Today, you never give your life to Jesus. Let me be a chance for you. That's you. So keep this after me as a prayer and confession. Lead to Jesus. Thank you for your personal Lord and Savior. All across this place, all the time. You want to give your life to Jesus. Let me just pray out for me. Just whisper. I'm going to shout out. Just whisper. Tell him this Jesus, I give you my life. Just whisper that to him right now. You know what Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I confess to our God. I believe that you raised from the dead. Died on the cross and rose from the dead. So I ask you right now, you've got to ask this. To forgive me of all my sin. To make me new. Now for all of us, Lord, we pray that you help us to be faithful. We you know that you do not forsake the faithful ones. You will not forget us at the right time. At the right time. At our time, right time. We will come to you. Thank you, God, for being done today. Let me ask all this in Jesus' mighty matchless name we pray in the church set. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you sensed God's presence. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ, or if your life has been impacted in any way, please send us an email at info at ChristCove.net. We would love to hear your story. And for those that committed your life to Christ, we want to help you on your new journey by sending our free Start Bible Kit in the mail. If you'd like to partner with us financially, simply click on the Give tab at ChristCove.net. There it will take you to a safe and secure page where you can set up a one-time or recurring gift to help us accomplish our vision, heaven full and hell empty. And as always, you can find out more about Christ Covenant on our website or on Facebook or Instagram at Christ Cove Houston.